I have a question. <coughs> Maybe um, you could, at, at the end of your talk, you alluded to uh, the machinations, the, the Nazi machinations behind Kristallnacht, uh, uh, which, as you, you said properly with your fair warning, at the beginning of your talk, uh, you weren't going to discuss, and now that you've given us all this uh, fascinating, ethnographically uh, rich uh, material about uh, Greenspan's uh, very strange fate and, and life and afterlife, I, I can see why uh, you wanted to remain with, with his story. Uh, and it's uh, Uh, after effects, but I think uh, maybe, maybe you could talk for a, a couple minutes at least, or a minute, about uh, the, the <coughs> misplaced guilt. Now I'm answering my own question, which is always a bad uh, practice for a moderator. But, but uh, the circumstances surrounding Kristallnacht, and now, in, in fact, if I, if I understand correctly, uh, these machinations had been set in motion for reasons that were internal to Nazi party politics uh, um, that bore, in fact, uh, little or no relation to his deed. Um, so maybe you could connect, connect up your, your story with uh, the uh, developments uh, in, in German anti-Semitism and Nazi uh, politik at the time. Without, without giving another lecture. <laughs> okay, if you're asking about the figures. <laughs> um, the question of uh, how <coughs> so-called Rice Kristallnacht, I mean Rice Kristallnacht somehow is a, mm, a problematic type. First of all, uh, as I also mentioned here, on the 7th of November, there were pogroms in Kostlin and Kurs, uh, which is not the Reis Kristallin, because that's on the 9th of November. Uh, second, the Reis Kristallin, the so called Reis Kristallin, uh, the event of the 9th and the 10th, uh, it's not so clear how it really, I mean, how all the pogroms started. Um, there, there were so many people interacting. We know, of course, that there were uh, <coughs> agents inside the uh, um, German so called league at the time uh, who were in favor of what they saw as an uh, outbreak of just folk star, and there were fractions who were strongly against it. The, um, the, the second one is, for example, I mean, normally it's, you know, Picked down by, by Göring, who said, Why, 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 why did you, you not just uh, slaughter 200 Jews uh, and left all the um, uh, German uh, goods intact? Because a lot of harm was done to, in 38, the process of so called Aryanization was in full speed. So all the Jewish property that was destroyed in the so called Kristallnacht was in the process of immediately going over into Aryan hands. So actually, what was destroyed was property that was more or less immediately after that belonged anyway to the German uh, folk or, or, or to the state or whoever grabbed it. So there was a big thing there. There was a, a huge conference that took place immediately after that on the 11th of November in the Luftfahrt Ministerium, the Ministry of uh, uh, Aviation, where Berger invited practically the whole elite of Germany at the time to discuss exactly those questions about, you know, who will pay? Should now the German, for example, Allianz, should they pay um, for the broken glass to the Jews who own the properties or not? And the, the insurance 
policy was if we don't pay, our international reputation is the collapse. So we have to pay the Jews. Um, they wanted to be a way to pay. So Goering said, no, don't pay the Jews. We have to find other things. And when we look at this, we have an excerpt of this um, a long discussion. The people there were Heinrich was in the meeting. Goebbels was there. Uh, um, Goering, of course, was there. Um, so about 120 very high-ranking people. And they made a lot of sarcastic, the sarcasm in this, in this uh, meeting is eminent. And the people who were there were people who later on once they became the head of the Deutsche Bundesbank. These were real kind of uh, bureaucrats also. And they started making jokes about uh, should we give the Jews certain places, the woods where they should be allowed to go. And then they start saying, yeah, maybe when there are animals that looks like Jews, it seems that we believe in kind of sarcastic remarks. And my reading of this uh, horrible document is that I think that both those who actually were in favor of the pogroms and those who were against it, something changed with the pogroms. So anti-Semitism, when it's set in action, also changes the, the way people think about it. Even those who actually thought it was a mistake, certainly there was a gap, there was something, you know, uh, uh, there was a step taken. Uh, and from then on, suddenly everything seemed open. They suddenly felt, mm, what's next? What can we do now? So they sat together in a group of 120 people, and so mm, how can we now go on? It, it was not important if they were in favor of going that route or not. Um, we also know, um, and this is uh, something that uh, was found in Steinberg's who uh, wrote uh, a very fine book that came out of the Southern University Press uh, two years ago in Kristana. Uh, we, we had a seminar together uh, for uh, off here in uh, Frankfurt. And he pointed that already out that um, about 33,000 33, men were put into concentration camps immediately after the pogroms. That had nothing to do actually with the pogroms. And there were not the same people who did that. And if you look how the percentage, it means in more or less every fourth or fifth German family, there was someone who was either in Sachsenhausen or Grunwald uh, or one in, uh, so it was in or Dachau, one was one in the camp. So the event, in a way, was small. But at the same time, the, the power of ex escalation was immense. Uh, both for the uh, side of the for the German Jewish side, uh, who after after this, uh, everyone was very disappointed, <coughs> and there was no kind of uh, rollback. It, it went from day to day worse. That was not the case between 33 and 38. There were, there, were, there were moments where more Jews went back into Germany between 33 and 38 than uh, emigrated. And that was exactly what the, the, the Nazis were uh, very kind of, uh, nervous about. And they were mainly responsible for pogroms, but also those who were against the pogroms, they somehow something, something changed in, in the way the anti-Semitism worked, I would say. Well, I, I, I wonder if I can ask you, sorry, can I go to the, the mic perhaps? Yeah. I, I wonder if I can ask you a slightly speculative question, which is, did Herschel Greenspan shot from rock 10 days earlier or 10 days later? Would his act have been used as a pretext for, for the Christoph Bauer overall? I mean, it seems to me that it's just this strange, unfortunate, uncanny coincidence that he chose that particular day which had such symbolic significance, particularly for the Nazi party, but the, the party then, the Nazis then used it as a, as a pretext to launch, um, to launch a Christophe. And of course I would like to know your answer to this too. <laughs> <laughs> 
do you think? What, what do you think? Do you think it, it would have? Do you think it, it would not have the same effect? I mean, we have, of course, the cases that you mentioned, like Frankfurt, uh, uh, in Davos. Actually, nothing happened. Exactly. Nothing. That, that's why I'm asking the question, because of these previous incidents. I mean, it just seems, I mean, I think 38, um, everything comes together in 38. And it starts, actually, it starts maybe more or less in January 38, yeah. the, the escalation. So I do think, well, I mean, Kristallnacht is also often, I mean, some historians have argued that it's a, that Kristallnacht is actually a turning point in terms of the control, uh, the control of, not, of, of Jewish policy within the Nazi party, that this is sort of the last gasp of brown shirts, you know, of taking street action, and that from this point onward, because Kristallnacht was actually such an international failure, there was such widespread disapproval of the law and destruction of property that from that point onwards, the SS actually takes control of Jewish policy. And, and that really is, it is a, a, a truly substantive shift uh, in, in, in the way in which the Jews are then treated. I, I would disagree with that analysis. However, I would say even the SS who then took control over was no longer the same SS that it was prior to the meeting. That's what I want to say is this meeting. Right. If you listen to the, the map, you know, there was something has changed. They saw this is possible. We can do this. You're right. I mean, there were, of, of course, also um, problems. Um, Maybe the harshest reaction uh, came from this country. Uh, the US uh, really broke ties with Nazi Germany after we started. Uh, not, not all countries. Um, one could also say that in 38, we also have, of course, Elyon, we have Munich, we have um, the, the, the pressure that the Jews should go out of Germany gets stronger and harder every single day. And the other countries, including uh, my home in Switzerland, tried harder and harder not to accept any Jews. So, so there was kind of, um, so the Kristallnacht played a role in this game. That's why I focus so much on the, on the Polish uh, German interaction that was, you know, this has not to do with this, has not to do with the It was, much earlier anyway, but at the same time, if you then look at how individuals acted during the Christopher, something that had never been done about them before, and what the role they played afterwards, for example, in the uh, Einhardt uh, or uh, in Lodge, or in different SS groups, you see that there is also a community of personality. A lot of people who were specifically involved in the Christopher were later on also involved in the Holocaust. So, I mean, that doesn't completely um, uh, negate the argument that the kind of antisemitism was uh, uh, the Vernunft, the kind of antisemitism of reason that the SS wanted to follow against the antisemitism of the uh, proletarian antisemitism of the Pope. Uh, that this did not somehow change uh, in terms of the hierarchy who was in charge. But I would always say that the pogroms also influenced those who, as we also all this room would say, there is no antisemitism of reason <laughs> that the SS claimed for themselves. It's of course, it was based on it. But uh, they, they uh, uh, used it. So we don't know, of course, what would have happened 10 days before or later, as, all, as always in history. But my feeling is it all came together. It was the right moment. And everyone was aware. I mean, I tried to find out, for example, in Kassel, who was responsible for the pogroms in Kassel. It was not Goebbels. Goebbels not even knew about it. It was no one in Berlin, obviously. So it started in Kassel. 
the 7th of November. It was not, uh, there is no historian who would claim it was organized. But, uh, so that shows that th th this situation was already so um, uh, tense uh, that somehow it crystallized. There's a very 
very strong residual Zionism. She had been Zionist at one point, was disillusioned. But she still retained the notion that Jewish politics and the diaspora were really, either politics or Jewish politics were impossible or that they were ultimately always in effect. Um, and that, of course, then translated into her view of the leaders of the Jewish Council of the during, during, during the war itself. So I think for that reason, she would have been reluctant to see his act, his act as one of civil disobedience. But you can't call murder civil disobedience. Well, it's just not, it's not in the same category. I didn't that. I didn't want to say that. But see it as some kind of political act rather than just as the act of, of a psychopath or some kind of sociopathic Yeah, I meant Yeah. I mean, in, in a way, it's, I, I, yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. I, I, think, uh, I have to think, but in a way, uh, that she was so much, uh, she was so critical against the jubilator, yeah. and at the same time, she was so critical about someone who was really on the totally different uh, uh, spectrum of, of um, taking action directly. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting fact. Um, but again, my feeling is, it's, it, it has to do with Sir Eichmann, which I think is very big, because they were Sir Eichmann book. Yeah. It has to do with Sir Eichmann book. Yeah. There she brings a lot of very strange things that she holds yeah. there that do not fit in her, uh, in, in a lot of other statements. It's just, yeah. I don't see her as so uh, coherent. I mean, also when we look at who did she uh, quote in terms of, of politics, I mean, she read a lot of she also quotes him, she also defends him, yeah. uh, but probably she doesn't know the facts, and she just writes here and also moves and answers. You know, of course, not only in the world, too. Uh, and she uses his uh, idea of, of what, what political action means. Um, uh, and there, of course, if you use Schmidt, there is no church politics. Can't exist. There is no state, there is no possibility to declare war. Uh, so in a way, uh, at the same time, I think you're right. I mean, there is the Zionist uh, orient, or at least this face of her, and, um, and uh, the role she played there uh, is, is one that we only now slowly discover. When she was in Frankfurt, for example, in the Man Museum, because then it was the collecting point for Judaica objects. And it's all about all and aren't her in the Jewish Reconstruction Organization. And after the war, they went to Frankfurt and Hofbau. Um, and then decided where should the Jewish ceremonial objects go to uh, because they were vehemently opposed to the Jewish state <coughs> in Europe. So they sent it to Buenos Aires, to Jerusalem, to New York. And she was part of that. It's also a phase that a lot of all the art scholars that don't know so much about it, how much she was involved actively, also in the Irish culture to point this. Frank, my friend. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to briefly go back to this sort of situation at the end of October 38, and to which I think you would sort of underplay a little bit, because I think the drama in Germany was very dramatic in the sense that um, what happened to the uh, stateless Jews um, was something that was little, I think, fairly little recognized by the rest of the population, also by the German Jews, we, we had a lot of drug problems. But until that point, uh, non-German non Jews um, were in many ways sort of not falling under the same kind of restrictions that legislation is mm -hmm. um, And so that um, I, I know the situation from Leipzig where um, Polish Jews then would flee into the, uh, the, the, the house of, of, the, of the American consul and hang out for weeks the same as uh, they, they did in this, in this border strip between 
Germany and Poland. And, and, and it's sort of from the dark. It, it, it's, it's a very under-researched um, uh, event or period. And, and the, the drama that, that really unfolds there is something that um, somebody like Rinsbach would, would, would have known. And, and somebody like Arendt would also have known, since she in Paris at the time worked in, in refugee aid and, and was involved in very sort of practical politics. And so the, the, the sort of rift that, that emerged between the Polish Jews and the German Jews also, um, I mean, that, that response uh, action sort of drives another wedge into this whole situation. I mean, you're right that. 38 at the end of it is, is sort of uh, uh, a situation sort of tightens enormously and, and uh, this, this sort of before and after and then sort of after November 38, it is clear to everybody in Germany also um, that, that everything has sort of changed. And I mean, that, that, that these sort of two weeks were actually 10 days between uh, I mean that this is sort of a very crucial period, and, and I, I'm wondering if, uh, when you write the book, are you going into more detail about this, and how this is sort of also reported in the press? Um, thanks, uh, Frank. Um, I mean, there is one point where, where I, I mean, all of what you say, I, I totally agree. Um, able to cover it because it's, it's, you know, I was asked by the publisher to write 128 pages and uh, not one more, not one less, so it, uh, it's a very restricted format uh, that the bank wants uh, and that we this uh, um, I think when you say, when you said only October or November for the German Jews it starts, that I disagree because in July 38, there was the Juli Aktion, especially in Berlin. And every Jew, there were, there were uh, about 4,000, 3,000 to 4,000 Jews were put in concentration camps for, for example, uh, crossing uh, the street without waiting for the signal. Uh, that was, uh, they, they were waiting exactly, they, they wanted to, to stay in the example, and about 3,000 to 4,000 were put in concentration. So there was already a lot of pressure also, not just the Polish Jews, but still you are right, the, the kind of um, how they saw each other and how this interaction were, um, I have been in touch and I think it's, it's a very interesting thing. And it comes through, of course, because that's why I always put the finger in this, that he, he has a Polish, Polish passport, he, I mean, reads from he did spoke. Never learned. So <laughs> he would have, uh, you know, had to go back to a country that he had no ties to. Um, uh, so in that respect, um, it's also tricky to know in what way he himself identified uh, with that group, or if it was like it came to him that suddenly he became again a Polish Jew, and then he felt all the non. Polish German Jews do not react in the way I would uh, hope to. Uh, that, you know, the stuff is very interesting. But, uh, I, uh, unfortunately, I uh, couldn't do it. I also have mentioned, but I, I do mention this, of course, in the book, uh, that after the so called Anschluss of Austria, there were also a lot of pogrom like uh, situations in Vienna. Uh, and exactly people who were there in charge. Came then uh, in charge for the Aktion uh, Einhard, and they were very cruel already uh, early in 1938. The Austrian Jews uh, suffered a lot of uh, the the most severe uh, ones, of course, is the Burgenland. The Jews from the Burgenland were all of them immediately uh, expelled. Uh, that was, in the end, the reason why their chance to survive the Holocaust was the highest. <laughs> Because they were small, they were early, so they had a chance if they were lucky uh, to survive. Yes, 
Adam. Sure, just we can just stand there. Oh, okay. okay. It's, a, it's just a small question that I was struck by the description you gave of uh, this meeting of the heads of you know, these bureaucratic figures making these satirical jokes about brutality that they were committing against the Jews. And I, I was even thinking that maybe humor was a way for them to, make, you know, obviously not the most diabolical of them, but you know, people who were maybe slightly uncomfortable, you know, or deeply uncomfortable, but how they had to conform uh, to what was going on. And so the I mean, humor was a way for them to somehow acknowledge the wrong and to look at the law at the same time, accept it. Uh, in some ways, I was wondering if humor was actually something that circulated widely among the general public in the newspaper. <coughs> there was jokes about the Pluto as a political battle or about the concentration camps about ghettos. I've never thought about this before, but it's just like maybe humor was part of the way people kind of cope with this. Like, really, there's something that we need to do also. I just want to get their thoughts on that. Well, interesting, interesting uh, question. Um, yes, but when, when I look at those kind of funny, you know, encounters between people like, that we wouldn't consider as being very funny, either yet, early, um, making jokes uh, that I'm sure they found, you can see that they were laughing, it was clear that they, they had fun somehow. Um, and I was trying to find out you know, what, what was the situation. Um, I think your reading of it not necessarily contradict to what I think, that um, something has happened that has never happened before on that scale. I mean, we should not forget that there were, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I wasn't mentioning this here, but the amount of people who were murdered in Cristobal has been, so it's, it's shocking, it's a shocking amount, more or less on the streets. So there were so many people involved uh, with this in every smallest village and part of Germany. Uh, schools and children were asked to participate in, in, you know, go there and participate there and so on. It, it had such a big impact that I do think, yes, it somehow must, uh, we, we must think how, how did people react to it. And the kind of, the standard reading was always, um, like David talking it's very clearly, there is the Reichsicherheitshauptamt, there is the SS, there is the people of Heidrich and the Gestapo. They actually didn't like it because it was uh, irrational in their view and they wanted to, to rather fill the concentration camps. They've already made up lists of over 70,000 Jewish men that they wanted to put in concentration camps and then they implemented it uh, at that moment uh, because they wanted to pressure them to organize their shops and their properties, um, so they did not like that a lot of this property was destroyed. But then they were meeting with the people who organized the program in the same room, and they had a lot to love. And my reading of this, those antagonists who were sometimes, you know, fighting quite strongly uh, against each other, uh, those were small parts, um, is that somehow for all of them there was something like um, uh, redemption, you know, that's what, what maybe Friedland uh, um, There was a kind of redemptive power of something happened. And they jointly, you know, into their opposing views and they continued to have opposing views. Because I haven't seen it from other notes. Uh, yeah, the other thing that you ask somehow, I think, is, is you know, to be a, another study to be a little bit uh, added to the big study. Yes. I may have missed this, uh, but um, your, your focus on the dramatic impact of Christophe on the 
Nazi leadership. Um, there's some idiosyncratic evidence that a lot of the German Jews uh, weren't focused enough on what really was going to happen to them. All the changes were incremental, you know, don't sit on park benches, you can't teach, you can't go to uh, public schools, and so on and so forth. The style not uh, wedged into their brains that, that the change is really critical. And when they came back from concentration camp, Saxon House and Wilkin immigration really began. So I'm wondering if you, it's not your research project, but I'm wondering if you have data on explosion of immigration uh, in, in the late 39. So. <coughs> I, I, I do actually deal in the book also with, uh, I, I go also beyond a bit. Uh, and there, there are many different things that happen immediately afterwards. One of them is are the kingdom transport. Uh, there are thousands of children who survived uh, because of, of this. That was uh, start immediately after. After uh, then, of course, a lot of the Jewish organization uh, were more or less abolished after the Kristallnacht, and <coughs> so that created a lot of problems inside the Jewish communities. Um, I think already, and I, I made this point. Oh, you know, there was the Avion conference, and it was also before. Program. And the Avion conference was set up by the countries where the, the Jewish uh, leaders hoped that in Avion, when they went there, they hoped that the result would be that more Jews from Germany will find uh, homes outside. Uh, so th there was already a big problem that they had problems to find uh, visas. And also, when you look, when you speak about statistics, um, who remained in Germany? First of all, more men than women emigrated. Because exactly what you said, uh, everyone who wanted to leave one of the concentration camps had to sign that within 10 days he is emigrating. And those were men and not women. So the women stayed behind. And the idea was oh, nothing will happen to them. Uh, this, uh, that's something you see in all oral testimonies. Always this idea is, oh, yes, they, they do, the Nazis are evil, but nicht gegen die Frau, not against uh, the women. And of course, there is also um, an economic uh, um, shift that those who had less, uh, for, you know, those who were uh, uh, poor had less a chance to survive and to get out. Because many of the countries you needed a relative who uh, has money or you, you need to prove that you bring out money. That's the point that I focused on, that the idea to first uh, Aryanize and uh, take away all the property from the Jews and then send them out to the neutral states or other states that the Nazis uh, policy um, acted out, uh, of course, um, was very problematic because most of them had no chance to find them uh, a visa uh, over the country. And those who had less money had even less of a chance. Um, and you see that it goes until September 39, uh, this situation. But um, a lot do manage. Uh, and that's also why, as we know, a high percentage of German Jews survived the Holocaust than, for example, of, of other Jews in other countries where there, were, there was less time to somehow flee after the occupation, uh, the murder immediately started in Poland, for example, or parts of Russia. So there was very little time for the German Jews, those who had money and those who uh, somehow uh, were not, you know. Elderly also, again, I, I didn't mention this, of uh, elderly people say, no, we, we cannot see that in statistics. I think we're, we're past the bewitching hour of 6 o'clock right now. Uh, um, 
I hope uh, you'll join me in thanking uh, Rafael Gross for a very stimulating <laughs> I'd like to thank the audience personally for 